Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that I can honestly say does his best proofreading right after he hits send. <laughs> it's Dale. <laughs> the damn truth. Yep. <laughs> no, bring it back, bring it back. He'll send me stuff and <laughs> and then send something again and say, I meant this. Yeah, let me put them other six words that I left out. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, dude? What's happening, man? Uh, rocking and rolling, man. Rocking and rolling, man. I've had a hell of a weekend. I am so thrilled to be back here and do this and get it yep. going on. But, man, I've been in uh, Charlotte all weekend with the... The Gathering Three Wrestling Fan mm. Fest, and it's been a ball. The wrestlers. Yeah, I love it, man. Yeah. We go down there every year and have a, just a big old blast, and it's fun, 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 fun. Well, I hear you. But we're ready to get down to business. Well, it was a good time for everybody. That's right. And you're back. You made it back in one piece. Yeah, feeling good and ready to roll. All right. You got anything you want to mention? Any kind of shout out or anything before we get going, bud? Yeah, we do have one really good. And this is a really good one, so we're only going to do one today. Really good Apple Podcast five star um, uh, review, and uh, this comes from Chihuahuas Really Rule, and it says, "What a find! How I didn't know about this podcast until now is a real mystery." Shout out to James Renner for sharing on Twitter. Absolutely love this podcast. These guys have a great rapport, and the details they cover each on uh, each case are on point. I look forward to listening to each and every episode. And, uh, man, what are you, you going to say about that? I don't know. I, I just want to know. I, I, it's awesome. I just want to know if her first name is Chihuahua and her last name is Really Rules. No, I think her middle name is Really. Really? <laughs> really Rule. Really? Yeah, I know, I know a guy named uh, Jack Rule. Oh, yeah. So, Really is Really. Well, Chihuahua Really Rules, we thank you a bunch. And thank yes, you for listening. Yes, that, that is really awesome. And it, it doesn't get much better than that. No, that's, and that's, that's top uh, of the line. really appreciate right it. And that's pretty much what we do is for right there yeah that is thank you so much that is what we do it for that's yeah, right thanks james for uh for shooting it out there yep we appreciate it yeah oh, man that's uh, how can you go from there i know well we'll see you all right <laughs> next week yep same bad time same bad channel <laughs> all right dude we're gonna get going on this podcast man, okay this episode and we've got a head scratcher we've got a mm-hmm. yeah but we're talking about a, a north carolina boy today yep and his name is Oakley Albert Kite Jr. Nice name. Kite. K I T E. I wonder if I make sunglasses. Oh. No, my wife. It would be Oakley. I'd have an L in there. Yeah, this is Oakley Albert Kite Jr. Okay. Now, Dale. He's born right here in North Carolina, man. Yeah, North Carolina boy. And he was born on May the 7th, 1951, in Nash County, North Carolina. His dad is Oakley Albert Kite Sr., and his mom is Edith Davis Kite. And they had one other child. It was a daughter. Her name was Barbara. Now, I guess them growing up, them him and his dad having the same name, Dale. Somebody calling the house. Hey, can I speak to Oki? Yeah. Well, you know when that everybody wants. You know, I guess sooner as soon as you're gonna find out you're gonna have a kid. Boy, if it's gonna be a boy, he's gonna be a junior. Yeah. Which is everybody says it. I mean, it's always it ain't really always the the greatest thing to do because it makes it a little difficult on everybody. Well, let me tell you, I'm a junior and it sucks. <laughs> Are you really? Yes. Oh, it sucks. Oh, I'm gonna call you Junior. Junior. Yeah, no, that's all right. That's why I go by Donnie. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, so I'm assuming he just went ahead and he just mixed it all up and just went by Al. Yeah, shortened Albert and went to Al. Way down, he dropped the other part and just said, "Well, let's just do Al." So that just sort of done that to distinguish from his, from his dad. Correct. So we're just gonna call him Al from here on out because that's what everybody else called him. Well, that's what he wanted, so let's do it. Now his dad, Oki Senior. He was a pretty famous dog trainer there in the area of uh, Nash County. Hmm. And was also a co-founder and partner in a North Carolina training company called Oki and Hunter Grove. How the heck we're going to do two episodes about back-to-back about dog trainers? Isn't that awful? That is weird, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Weird. Yep. <laughs> now, Just makes, you, makes you ponder. Yep. Now, Al's mom, Edith, she passed away pretty early in Al's life. She was like only 46 years old. Hmm. 46 48 years old yeah 48 i think yeah when she died and this was in january of 1970 hmm. and i think al was only 18 years yeah. old at the mm-hmm. time so pretty young yeah, it's hard to take care now yeah that'd be rough on him but they said that al went on to be pretty well adjusted for a young guy mm-hmm. and he'd grown up there in halifax county north carolina and this was area is pretty well known for like tobacco and cotton farming dale yeah, there's a lot of the states known for that, but I guess it's pretty deep there. Yep. And he attended Weldon High School in the town of the same name, <laughs> Weldon. 
it's kind of like Shelby High School. That's right. Shelby, yeah, okay. And there he would become friends with a young woman named Gail Kay. And they were pretty good friends and remained friends for the next couple of years. And Al went away to school. But when Al went to college, he didn't go away that far. It was about an hour away, I think, to... Mm. To uh, Wilson, North Carolina. Yeah, right? Wilson, North Carolina. I've been to Wilson, North Carolina. Yeah. And there he attended Atlantic Christian College, where he majored in business administration. Really? Yep. So he was doing well for himself. Yeah. Now, in 1971, Al began working for Stone and Webster. This was a pretty large engineering services company. Hmm. And he would end up working for this company for over 31 years. Well, that's a pretty good, pretty good run. Yeah, and he had several jobs working for him and a variety of jobs. It took him all across the United States. And he began his Stone and Webster employment by working at the Surrey Nuclear Plant. And this was about an hour and a half southeast of Richmond, Virginia. And there he started out as a timekeeper before being promoted to accountant position. And he would eventually become a department head. So he kept moving up and, yeah. and doing the right thing. Pretty steady. Yeah. Now, in 1976, Al would, um, he got married to his high school friend that he had befriended back in high school. Her, you know, we talked about Gail right. Kay. And in the interim handful, let's say, now, while they were, Al was off to school and he was doing his thing and she was doing her thing, she had been in a relationship at the time and uh, she had had a daughter by another man. Right. But they reunited and they got married. And Al had him a stepdaughter. Yeah, her name was Julie. Yep. yep. And But Al and Gail divorced about 10 years later. But it was said that Al and Julie would remain pretty close. They were pretty well, good friends. It was friends. pretty much like... Uh, He's her dad, you know? Yeah. I know how that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, they remain pretty close. Well, I'm sure. But like we were talking about, Al's job took him all over the United States and the world. Right. Big time. Mm hmm And that was probably hard all night. It's probably, you know, had a lot to do with the, the marriage busting up. And, you know, I ain't saying it is because it doesn't really say anywhere that we could find what the reasoning was. But I'm sure him being gone so much time isn't easy yeah i imagine it it, pretty, it took a good toll on yeah it might have paid the bills but other than that it, was, it makes it hard yep. on everything else yep and he spent time as a project manager for positions in massachusetts texas new york nevada wyoming and tennessee and he even spent a short period of time as senior timekeeper on a project in north africa the country of algeria what does that mean senior timekeeper i don't know does that mean like he's keeping everything in to get done on time. That, yeah, that I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he's standing there with, with a stopwatch or something, right? Probably keeping the flow. Right. Okay. Uh, managing delivery, scheduling. Make sure everything's on time. Yeah. Gotcha. That's pretty, probably a pretty hectic job. Yeah, stressing. But now, like we said, Al and Gail, they got divorced in 1988, and their separation seemed to be amicable. And Al, Al carried on a good relationship with his stepdaughter, Julie. And at this point, Al became a bachelor. Yeah, he just said to hell with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the 1990s, Al became manager of accounting procedures in California, which meant that he took on the task of working on finances for multiple projects. And this included the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. This was a San Francisco's international airport and the Bay Area Rapid transit. Mm, that's some big projects. Yeah. All those are big, real big deals. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until 1998 that uh, he was uh, given the proposition to move to Colorado Ooh. to take on a job. And I think this was going to suit him a lot better. Yeah, because, you know, he always enjoyed doing all kind of outdoors activities. I mean, he liked golfing, biking, camping, and hiking, skiing, and all that kind of stuff. And all that stuff comes with Colorado you know, when you think about it. So he was probably quite anxious to jump on that oh yeah i imagine so but al moved to aurora colorado in an area that was just right outside of denver metropolitan area right so this was what he was going to do and he bought a property in aurora along south helena street and the home which is about halfway between cherry creek state park and buckley air force base 
And it was just, a, like I said, a stone's throw away from Interstate 225. Hmm. But his house was a two-story townhouse, which had a lot more room than he needed. Yeah. And Al, he kind of joked that it was more room than he needed, and especially for a middle-aged bachelor. Yeah, he was, he was never at home. Yeah. Always going doing outside stuff. So what he decided to do was turn this uh, basement he had in that townhouse into a standalone apartment. Right. This was about year 2000, early 2000s. Well, we had to help him pay the bills, you know, pay, he, probably pay his mortgage, basically, while, you know, also using up some of that space. Yeah. So that would be a good idea. Yeah. And this came in handy in 2002 when the company that Al worked for, Stone & Webster, they decided to downsize. Mm. And he was let go. But he was. Uh, it was said he was able to gain employment again just a little while later. It's kind of crazy, you know. You think as much as he was doing, they'd, they'd probably need him. 30-something years, yeah. yeah. Sorry, with a downsize, you got to go. But he began working for a company called Carter Douglas, and they were a consulting firm. Hmm. So for the next couple of years or so, his life proceeded in just, you know, like a his leisurely, casual way. He had very few commitments and then was able to spend his time as he wanted. Well, he's probably really happy by now. Yeah. He got in all kinds of golfing, hiking, skiing, and made full use of the area, you know, Colorado's climate. Right. To do his outdoor activities. Yep. Happy, happy. And while at work, Al became known as a comforting, helpful person. And he was always willing to go the extra for anyone that needed his help. Yeah, it sounds like he's a real cool dude. Uh, yeah, I'd, I would hang out with him. Oh, yeah, sure. He looked like a, I mean, you know, looked like he's just a happy, lucky guy and does everything he do to uh, make other people feel good about himself. Yeah. And it wasn't until 2004, that was when things in Al's life was about to change. First, uh, he began dating a woman named Linda Angelopoulos. Very good. Yeah, and they seemed to get along pretty well. They went to parties and stuff together and... Uh, they saw each other at picnics and things, and they just started striking up conversations, and they just got along really well. Right. And I think I kind of played it down a little bit for a month or two. Nothing mm-hmm. Real slow, if you will. Yep. Yeah. And then earlier in 2004, the tenant that Al had been renting the basement to was planning to move out. Yep. They uh, gave Al a notice, and they were going to uh, move out, and they weren't renewing their lease. Right. And this tenant did move out in May of 2004, and Al, he began making plans to find somebody else to rent that space. Yeah, I'm sure he's be missing that money after a while. Yeah. And he put an ad in local newspapers and different areas, and it wasn't long. You know, he would start receiving some, you know, people who was interested in it. Mm-hmm. But there was one who seemed more interested than the others. Yeah, a lot. Now, there was one man who responded to Al's advertisements for a roommate on May the 19th of 2004. Now, this man, he identified himself as Robert Cooper, and he wanted to move in almost immediately. And he was willing to give Al a security deposit and the first month's rent to make it happen. Yep. He wanted it bad. Yep. And Al told his girlfriend, Linda, about his new potential tenant yeah i think he did actually have other people interested but this guy was just coming in like throwing money at him like i really gotta have it Mm -hmm. and al had uh, told linda that you know that he just moved from the east coast and had taken a job for wells fargo Mm -hmm. but he didn't know what kind of capacity he had with him he's just working for wells fargo right and linda was from the east coast too so it's kind of like they're all Mm -hmm. fell in there together right yep And he was the guy that the Robert Cooper was staying at the home of his sisters, is what he had told Al. Right. And that's why he needed a place of his own. He was ready to get out of there. Yeah, I bet so. Now, Al's girlfriend, Linda Angelopoulos, never saw this Robert Cooper's face. And she had even stated in a later interview that she'd given Paul Holes. She had came over to Al's house and... She went to use the restroom, and when she came out, Robert Cooper was leaving. It was like he had to leave pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And it was like um, he didn't want to see her at all. 
Yeah, he, or basically he didn't want her to see him. Yeah, exactly. Seemed like any time she come, he was turning his head or he was going out the door or just made really sure. It was probably kind of odd that he never even wanted to, to meet her face to face. Yeah, but, you know, at the time she probably didn't think nothing about it. All this is hindsight, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, Linda. Yeah, you know, while it's going on, you might be like, hey, this dude's a dick, but what? You know, but <laughs> you don't ever know. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's got their own ways, I yeah, guess. So, yeah, if you don't want to talk to me, that's fine. Linda was unable to get a look at this guy's face and she was able to describe the kind of clothing he was wearing and she said he was well dressed and wearing a nice pair of pants and a suit coat Mm -hmm. in addition to the details that she witnessed from you know she gathered from conversations with al that this robert cooper was described as being in his 40s had dark wavy hair stood about five foot eight inches tall and weighed about 180 pounds Mm. that's what they described him as and what one thing that was kind of unique about him is that he walked with a limp. Yeah. And he carried a cane to sort of stabilize himself. Which is kind of odd to be 40. Yeah. But you never know. Yeah, you never know what. People could, have problems. Could have been in a wreck. Could have been a. It fell under a bush hole. You never yeah, know. never know. But Linda gained most of this information in you know that brief glance that she saw of him right. as she exited the bathroom and looked out the window at his profile. She Probably said later, going, tink, 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 with his cane going in the yeah, said, and then she was quoted saying, I just saw him for an instant. Kind of odd, isn't it? Very odd. But, yeah, looking back on it, that's when you find it odd. Yeah. Right now you're just going, oh, what's up with this guy? Yeah. But now in addition to Linda's lone sighting, they were a group of unrelated witnesses that later recalled seeing this uh, man named Robert Cooper. There was a local professor from the University of Colorado that owned some property that she was renting out. And a man matching the exact same physical description of this Robert Cooper met with her to discuss the property. And this man did not have a limp or did he carry a cane. Right. And in fact, he even spoke to her with a Romanian accent. You know, it's kind of funny that she says it's matching the exact same physical description, except this, except this, except this, and he talked different. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. But this lady, she was a professor at Colorado, and she taught Romanian, yeah. and she picked up on that Romanian accent. So, you think he was faking it, or it was just... It was coming through. I don't know. So it's hard to tell. Was he faking that or was he faking English and it was coming through one or the other? It's also odd that of all the people in Colorado that he would go talk to somebody who teaches Romanian. Yeah. You know, somebody that teaches it, they're going to pick up on stuff. Oh, yeah. If he's faking it, you'd think that she would pick up on him faking it. Right, and that's probably, he's probably speaking English, but she could hear it underneath. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean, these people are trained in this stuff. Right. But this man had apparently approached several potential renters in the days and weeks leading up to him getting in touch with Al in his advertisement. And at least three of these renters having recalled encounters with this mysterious man, Robert Cooper. Hmm. And all recall him having different characteristics. And he had different accents, mannerisms, and et cetera. So it was like this guy's putting on a front or something. Yeah. Yeah. Being different everywhere he goes. Yeah, like you know, a man of mystery, man of disguise. Right. Yeah, international man of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> but one of these potential renters described the man as being in his mid thirties, while another described him as being in his fifties. Hmm, that's all over the place. So it's, isn't it? it's a big range. Yeah. And in one case, a cane and a limp was present, whereas another, he just walked totally fine hmm. without needing any kind of assistance. Sound like a crazy movie, like an uh, usual suspects. Yeah. Yeah. So some of these could be legit and some of them couldn't. Hmm. Yep. Sound like he's playing a lot of people here. See yep. what's going on. Now, I know we're talking about these other people, but th- th- this is kind of given the, what we're up against. Here's some background. Yeah, this guy. And now there, were, there was one renter. It was an older woman recalled getting creeped out by the way this strange Robert Cooper moved around through her home. Mm. She said that he seemed to examine all the windows through the house and said he very, very thoroughly yeah yeah and said very little hmm. yeah she's probably going this guy's weird so yeah there's something going on here made her feel uneasy yeah 
This was right around the time that Robert Cooper responded to Al Kite's advertisement in May of 2004. Now, one of Al's neighbors recalls seeing this man leave Al's home on May 19th. So the police pinned that down as the first time he made contact with Al Kite. Now, over the next day or two, at least two of Al's neighbors recall having odd encounters with the man. A male neighbor tried to approach this Robert Cooper guy, but was completely ignored. Hmm. In another case, a female neighbor said she encountered this man. Um, he was walking nearby and just recalled just staring through her like, you know, without talking. Just, you know. So it looks like he turned his head from the first guy and then just stared at her like staring a hole. That's kind of odd. Yeah. Very weird. Hmm. And the lady also said that when she countered the man, he was walking without a limp. Very crazy. Yep. Kind of seems, uh, depends on who he's talking to, which is which uh, identity he's wearing. Yep. But now at the time of all these strange instances, um, Al was totally unaware. It was just a day or two after meeting Al Kite that the two reached an agreement. In addition to security deposit, this man named Robert Cooper would also provide half of the the first month's rent and would move in immediately. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're moving to the morning of Saturday, May 22nd. This is when Al drove his new girlfriend, Linda, to the airport. She was leaving to go on a week-long trip to Virginia. and Going she, back home. Yep. And around 3.30, she landed and gave Al a call and told him that she had just landed. And Al seemed to be in a, a good mood on the other end. And what we failed to mention, too, is on this way to the airport, they actually became official boyfriend-girlfriend. Yeah. Finally just went ahead and said it. Yeah. Oh. Because when she called him, she said, hey, boyfriend. And she was, he was like, hey, girlfriend. You know, so... So they've just, they made official on that way to the airport. Right. They've been taking it slow and not doing it, but I think when they knew they was going to be separated for some time, that mm-hmm. they both felt it, right? Yep. Yeah. How sweet. Yep. <laughs> and when she finally got to Virginia, she'd called him again, and he seemed a little bit more somber this time. So yeah, something weird going on. Yeah. He didn't seem as perky self. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. So, you know, she's got things going through her head. We yep. just become boyfriend and girlfriend this morning, and now he's weirding, weirding out. Mm-hmm. But they just uh, wished each other a nice weekend and said goodbye. Hmm. And that would be the last time that anyone spoke to Al Kite. And that now, was the, what, 22nd, right? Yeah. Okay, I was keeping up with my date. Now, it was two days later, on Monday, May the 24th, um, Al didn't show up for work. Right. And, you know, he was always one to be prompt and always on time and be yeah, at work. Right, right. Yeah, like us. Now, yes. his employer then contacted his sister, who lived in Virginia. Right. And But she was like the, I think, the emergency contact or something like that. Yes, yeah. on his work application. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, she couldn't just drive to Colorado. Yeah, she couldn't and, run over and check on him. Yeah, so what she did was call the police to do a, a welfare check on Al. Exactly. Yeah. She'd get permission to do that, her being the emergency contact. Now, the police got to the home, and they went in, and they didn't receive any kind of response to their knocking at the door or anything. Right. Well, before they went in, they knocked on the door, of course. Yeah. You know, repeatedly knocked on the door, went around, knocked on, checked all the doors and everything, but nothing. Yep. And they was looking upstairs, didn't see anything. Right, and then they went on in. They went down to the basement. And it wasn't. It never said how they went in, whether they had to break in or they had to found a key or the girl knew where a key was or anything. It was just, they were looking, and then they're in the house. Well, if they want in, they're going to get in. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. I'm just gonna, saying. Yeah. It was, not, <laughs> it was not specified how they gained entry. Yeah. Feel but, it that way. But they didn't find anything upstairs. And then down in the basement, these responding officers found the body of Al Kite laying face down. Mm. And it was pretty gruesome. Yeah. From the get go. Yeah. There was blood splatter everywhere located along the wall, the floor, around his body. Pretty much indicating that his death had not been a peaceful one, Dale. No. <laughs> far from it when you hear more details. It wasn't far. Peaceful was one word you would never use. Yep. Now, there was a, t- a detective, Tom Sobieski, of the Aurora Police Department, responded to the call and would become one of the first lead investigators on this case. 
and he would describe the crime scene as the worst he had ever seen. Yeah, that tells you something right there. Yeah. And investigators noted a wound on the back of Al's head, which they thought indicated that he'd been hit from behind, and most likely theorized this happened when he was walking down the basement steps. Right. But what was most disturbing was the realization that Al had not died painlessly or quickly. The police soon discovered that Al had been bound with a cord, not only his hands behind his back, but his feet too, and which were tied to his ankles with ligatures. Yeah, it was really kind of like a hog tying, but really more, way more dramatic. Yeah, he was face down pretty much, and his feet pulled back, and his feet, the bottom of his feet facing upward pretty yeah. much. Mm-hmm. And from there, the person that attacked Al had tortured him. Yeah. Mercilessly. Mercilessly. For hours. Mm-hmm. What they, it's what they pretty much seemed to do. Well, you know, he knew from just being around, you know, if he was there and he knew, you know, nobody was ever over at Al's hardly ever, except for this one lady, and he was taking her to the airport, that he probably had plenty of time to do whatever he wanted to do. Yeah. But it was, no, it was unknown at the time that the killer had been invited in or somebody broke in. Right. But the investigators pretty much theorized that the killer had struck Al when he was walking down to the basement. Mm-hmm. Now, public statements from Detective Sobieski and Al's loved ones seemed to indicate that earlier in the week when Al was talking to this mysterious tenant, that they made mention of a recliner that was in the living room, which Al wanted to move down to the basement. Mm-hmm. And the two had spoke about it being unable to fit through the stairwell. And it was thought that um, Al, living up to his, you know, being kind and, you know, hospitable, yeah. was, was going to help his new tenant move this recliner downstairs. Well, you know, they said, you know, the, the, he, he was interested in it and his, him being the guy he is. Well, I don't use it. I'll just take it downstairs for you to use. No problem. Mm-hmm. And then knowing this guy's walking with a cane and, and a limp, He's really going to try to do all the, the heavy lifting for him. Yeah. Being that guy again, you know, just trying to do the right thing. See what that got him. Mm-hmm. And they uh, say he probably smashed him in the back of the head as he was going down the steps, which would cause the large gas that they were talking about. Yeah. Now, there was some evidence that Detective Sobieski and there were some other investigators were able to find. Now, it appeared that the brutal torture and murder of Al that the killer had then proceeded to eat some food from Al's kitchen, mm. took a shower, and even uh, slept in his bed. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's even been reported that he even wore some of Al's clothing. So I wonder how they knew all this. I don't know. That is one thing. I, I studied in this case how they knew he slept in the bed and how he knew they knew he tried on clothes. Yeah, and it, you know, because I never seen where they said they found anything like fingerprints or dna or anything like that in the bed or in his clothes so, yeah. so how would they know I don't, I don't know unless all the sheets were pulled off and i don't know i don't know either it's just odd now there was a statement from a neighbor that seemed to indicate that this uh, mysterious man left early sunday morning but not before conducting a thorough cleaning of al's home the house had seemingly been wiped down for fingerprints and bleach had been poured down the shower drain, I guess, to destroy any kind of forensic evidence. Yeah. And the killer had soaked multiple knives in bleach afterwards, filled the sink up. Yes. And poured all the knives. and Every that, knife that was in the, the knife uh, block. Yeah, and there were some keys in there, a drinking glass, and I think it was a, a honing rod and some other little... Yeah, like he was sharpening a knife. Yeah. Yeah. And the keys were the, actually the keys that uh, Al had gave him to so when he get ready to move in have the red keychain on him mm-hmm. yeah yep but like i said the drain had been plugged and all that stuff was in the sink crazy yep just waiting for him to get there but they've been filled with clorox bleach now immediately investigators been working on a motive for this crime and originally it had been seen to be a, like a crime of passion like somebody mm. you know I don't even think I would go there. Not to me, because, man, I know we didn't really get into what happened to him, but the guy was stabbed over 22 times. Yeah. I mean, he's, he was stabbed through his eardrums on both ears. Knives were inserted over his eyes and into his eye sockets, stopping yeah. stabbed. And his throat had been cut so many times that it had almost been decapitated. So, I mean, it was a serious, serious 
torment. And the bottom of his feet, or his feet were barefoot, and his bottom of his feet were tortured. Yeah. Like beaten. Right. That's got to be painful. Yeah. Yes. Now, I think they said that they assumed that he used that honing rod for that. Yeah. So you think it wasn't like, I know a lot of countries they do that, and they probably use like a wooden rod or something. Do you think a, a steel honing rod smashing your bottom of your feet while you're bound mm-hmm. with knives that crammed in your ear? Yep. Mm. Yeah, so he did not go quiet. It's, it's, it's really sad. Yeah, but they couldn't figure out, figure out anyone who would be in Al's life that would have a reason to pick a fight with him or torture him or right anything so that's why you automatically look at the guy he's been talking to yeah in my opinion and they began to develop a theory that uh, it was a methodically planned robbery and police would soon learn that a couple of al's items seemed to be missing from the house mm. namely his vehicle and his cell phone yeah i'd probably notice that and the police they began searching for these items and, and his bank card right yeah yeah now later on the day of monday may the 24th al's blue and gray gmc pickup truck was found and it'd been parked a little over a block away from al's home along the street and investigators conducted a search of the vehicle hoping to find find something you know of the killer right and they also began the thorough search of al's home but in the truck you know what they found all they found was a uh atm receipt yeah that was laid neatly on the seat yeah just like here you go yeah yeah, and we're going to talk about that, too. Yes. Yeah. They were able to find some trace amounts of DNA presumably left by the killer. and they, Yeah, maybe on the steering wheel or something. Yeah. Yeah. And they were looking through the garbage in Al's kitchen, and investigators found a discarded rental application. Mm-hmm. Now, this application, Dale, Here we which go. looked to have been handwritten by this mysterious tenant moving into Al's basement apartment, Contained the stranger's name, mailing address, social security number, and phone number. Mm-hmm. And the name on the rental application was Robert Cooper. <laughs> now, However. <laughs> yeah. The address, which supposed to belong to his sister, this Robert Cooper's sister, was actually a building on the University of Colorado's medical school campus. Mm-hmm. And it gets even weirder. Yep. The social security number, when they looked it up, turned out to belong to an unrelated woman who had no connection to this case at all. So she probably just made it up. Made it up and bam. It just, you know. Mm. And then there was the phone number on the rental application, which was an active phone number. But the phone didn't belong to any phone line. It was a burner phone. Right. And it was, uh, I guess, the prepaid kind that you'd find it. Like, like 7-Eleven. Like yeah. Kind of so I think that is where he bought it. 7-11, yeah, from a yeah. 7-Eleven, yeah. And when police organized a trace of the phone, as well as Al Kite's phone, they were surprised that uh, these phones were still active and both of them moving throughout you know, the Denver area. This is what was crazy, though. This uh, Robert Cooper took these phones and dumped them in a transient part of town. Hmm. And I guess homeless people pick them up and start using them just sort of cover their cover his tracks right and you know when they look they look back on this uh to find out where this particular phone had come from they could trace it back to the store where it was bought which was a 7-eleven but when they went in to check the uh the video surveillance cameras they uh noticed one thing that this guy's pretty damn smart that uh they uh keep their videos for 30 days Hmm. After 30 days, they record over them. So, you know, when he activated his phone on the 31st day. Wow. So they knew, so he knew that how long it would take for them to erase the evidence, and then he could start using this particular burner phone. I mean, he, this guy, this Robert Cooper guy. He was very, very calculated. Yeah. He had planned this out for a while. Yes. He was going to murder somebody. Somebody was yep. getting, getting it bad. Now, this uh, tentative connection to the nearby University of Colorado Medical School would become one of the very few leads that the investigators had to work with. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to the mailing address on this Robert Cooper's rental application, it was bearing the school building. And like I said, there was now being a a burner phone being purchased off the campus itself. And police would later learn that some of the rental properties that this mysterious Robert Cooper 
applied to had been advertised on flyers within the University of Colorado's library. So this guy was staking out some places to rent to possibly murder somebody. Yeah, to pull this off, right? Yeah. And they hadn't been posted anywhere else, not on the Internet, nor in newspaper ads or anything like that, just around the Colorado Medical School campus. Mm. And this uh, this lead started becoming very troubling, Dale, the, connecting one of Al Kite to the University of Colorado Medical Campus would soon have their hands full of investigating another urgent matter. Right. Now, a quick check of Al Kite's financial history showed that his credit cards had been used substantially after his supposed time of death, but his ATM card had been used on the night of his murder, right. May the 22nd. And like we talked about, when they discovered Al's GMC pickup truck, it was you know parked a block and a half away from his home. They found that ATM receipt on the front seat. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like he wanted them to find it. Yeah. Now, these investigators were able to track down this specific ATM the card had been used on at a nearby Wells in Fargo. And this ATM had a built-in camera. Of course. And they were able to get the police a glance at the killer. Oh, right in the face. Yeah. Eh, except for he had a ski mask on. Yeah. <laughs> he was smart, dude. He was good, man. It's almost like he's tormenting them here a little bit, you know, antagonizing them. You could see his eyes and the bridge of his nose yeah. and just a little bit of his upper cheeks, and that's it. That's it. But the killer had also been wearing gloves, and when he visited ATM, the police were unable to get any kind of fingerprints on the machine or the truck itself. I'm sure. He's not stupid. Now, one of the things that the police uh, made the police disregard the case of robbery is that while at the ATM, the killer withdrew an even thousand dollars. But I think we talked about this, and that, yeah, we that may have been only the the maximum amount he could get out. Right. Yeah. A lot of people saying, well, you know, he had lots more than a thousand dollars in his bank account, and he could have got through it the whole weekend, but during that one day, there may be some kind of limit what you can draw out on the one day. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure he didn't want to spend no more time than he had to to get get the max out and then move on. Yeah. He wasn't going to take a chance on getting a few more dollars and getting caught. Yeah. And it's kind of funny that he basically took enough the money that he paid for his deposit, for his and, deposit and his rent. Yeah. So he basically got his money back and rolled out. Yeah. Uh, this just blows my mind. This case yeah. is just yeah. unreal. It just keeps getting more twisted, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Now, within days of the murder, the potential motive of robbery was sort of thrown out uh, due to a couple of pretty pronounced reasons. Uh, namely, that the killer would have withdrawn more from the ATM than they did, like we talked about. Mm-hmm. And the police also noted that nothing of value seemed to be missing from Al's home. No. Yeah. No, he even took the keys back to the Al's place and threw them in the sink with the bleach. Yeah. He left the truck. I guess I'm assuming he walked back over there, threw the keys in there, left the, the receipt on the seat, and then uh, threw them in there with the knives and other stuff he already had in the sink. Yeah. Now, uh, investigators didn't believe that the torture of Al had been done to obtain any information, such as PIN number or his bank account. But, I, you know, all of his loved ones pretty much said, you know, if it, People wanted money, he would have given it to him. Right. And um, give him the pin number or whatever. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. This guy, he wanted torture. He wanted yeah. He wanted to inflict some pain. Yeah. I don't think there's nothing to do about money except for getting his back. Yeah. Now, following the murder of Al, police put together a list of characteristics that may be exhibited by this Robert Cooper. The following may or may not be true, but became connected to the case in sort of one way or another right when you know if you think about it if he would even check one of those references man this may have ended in a whole different way yeah just one of them because yeah. they were all wrong yeah on this um on his application yeah yeah hate to say that but yeah man and they, they claim the killer may be from the east coast and or the area of around new jersey right and he may have some connection to banking industry and maybe working for Wells Fargo. Right. And it could have been something to do with his other job. You never know. So he hold around the world and Algiers and everywhere else. But I think, uh, like you said, the FBI somewhere or another has said something, but they thought he was from New Jersey, but they never, it's never come out to say why they think that. Yeah. Right. And he, he had some uh, familiarity with the University of Colorado. 
and you know the library but i just wondered if the library had any surveillance cameras hmm, i don't know you know they could have went back and pulled that footage hmm. you know putting good up question. them flyers good question yeah and it's likely that he dressed professionally on a regular basis what they claimed right Finally, he may have at one point attempted to become a police officer. Investigators theorized that this kind of behavior and violent crime followed up with mind games perpetrated against the police may have come from a denial or failure to become a police officer. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. buy that one. Uh, I think this guy was just out for a thrill kill. Either that or somebody sent him to kill him. Yeah. Because it, it can almost be a contract man, you know, just to do it so carefully. The, every little detail is covered up and i mean and then it's done and you're gone you wait those 31 days you know he's gonna be alone even though neighbors were home next door and you know this townhouse wasn't out in the middle of nowhere mm. you know i've seen videos where the neighbor said you know that day that actually the day that uh he took her to the airport he had the neighbor over there and fixed a pipe in the basement and he went over and helped him because he yeah. just lived right beside of him yeah these houses are connected together yeah, right together yeah so this dude knew what he's doing yeah now, it is believed that the killer stood about 5 foot 10, weighed about 175 pounds, and had dark, wavy hair. And it is believed he's in his mid-40s, but again, it is believed that he could have been younger or slightly older than that. It's kind of crazy how they can go from 20s to 50s. I mean, that's yeah. a big, big difference. That's a big jump. But he could have been disguising himself. That's like he's either three foot seven or eight foot nine. I can't really tell. I, you know, when I saw him the other day, he was one hundred seventy five or four hundred fifty pounds. It was, that's that big range. If yeah. you look at that, look at it that way. I don't know if you see somebody with, with a suit on or something, and they're walking with a limp and a cane. You just assuming they're older. I would, yeah. I hate to say that, but I would assume they're. Well, he would probably older because he probably hunched over a little bit just to give it a little more flavor. Yeah. Yeah. The dude knows what he's doing. Yeah. Whoever he is. Now, later in May, Al's remains were released to the custody of his loved ones and flown back to North Carolina, uh, Halifax, North Carolina. And his funeral services took place on June the 2nd, 2004, uh, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was overseen by Reverend Stan Lewis. Al was memorialized and remembered by those who, that knew him, his girlfriend Linda, his sister Barbara, and her family his stepdaughter Julie, and uh, several friends and other relatives. Mm -hmm. And later that day, Al Kite was buried in the the church cemetery where he rests to this day. Mm. And this killer has never been caught. Nope. Not even close. Mm Mm-mm. Sad. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, this is a... I'm thinking this contract, dude, for some reason, I don't know what, what the reason would... Well, I don't know about that, but it's just... It just seems like it's really, really, really detailed, thought out. Is It wasn't just, I mean, somebody wanted to kill him, they could just pull up and shot him in the damn driveway or something, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But this dude, either he was really getting off on what he was doing, or it was there to make a statement. Yeah. So, it's pretty wild, especially the, the feet smashing. I mean, that's just something that, you know, I know that there's a lot of countries that do it as a torture to try to figure out, you know, stuff, but that's just... Joe regular serial killer, he's not be going to come in there and whip in your feet. Unless he's just this Robert Cooper. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe he had a background in a lot more something else. Mm-hmm. You know, some some kind of paramilitary stuff or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but these, they said these the knots that were used to bound Al Kite were real meticulous. Yeah. So he had some training somewhere right. along the way to be able to tie somebody hog tie somebody and restrain them like that yeah and they were uh, hog tied in a peculiar way it wasn't just a regular old thing yeah but that is the story of al kite a very sad story yeah it is such a good guy to yeah willing to help anybody and do anything for him. Or somebody to take him out like that I yeah mean, that mm, that's that's got to be awful yep all right, Dale, we are going to get out of here. Let's get out of here, man. We'll get some rest. Yep. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is the Crack, Crack House, House Chronicles. Chronicles.